Well, I'm, I'm the second German in a row up here. This is clearly a, a failure of event planning to foist two Germans on you in, in succession. Um, yeah, so we have 30 minutes to talk about the ocean, and it's sometimes not a pretty picture, so steal yourself, um, but, but, but there's also hope. Um, we're the Ocean Conservancy, we're a classic advocacy organization. We traditionally work on things like stop overfishing, stop polluting the ocean, uh, stop trying to build oil platforms off of Northern California, a classic um, environmental advocacy. Um, five years ago or so, it became clear, though, that we could not call ourselves the Ocean Conservancy and ignore climate change. And in fact, not only could we not ignore it anymore, it paled everything else uh, massively. Um, and the reason that came to us, and now we have to go back about 50 million years, there was in, in, in geologic history, there was an event about 53 million years ago. It was the PETM, don't ask me to tell you what that actually stands for, but it was one of those extinction periods. It lasted 20,000 years, and what happened was completely analogous to what's going on right now, which is that the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere went to about 800 parts per million, which is the track we're pretty much on um, right now. Um, and what happened was that things got hot, and that things got hot too fast and that things got too loaded with carbon too fast. Name it 20,000 years, keep that in mind. We're doing the same thing in 200 years. What happened back then was not pretty. We had massive extinction events and currents changed and I mean there was the system basically flipped out. The system completely changed and it got poor. It moved less, it got less diverse. Um, it completely rearranged the biology in the ocean. Would such a thing occur today, it would be catastrophic for you and me, right? Things did not go well for the higher life forms. Let's put it that way. Generally, they don't when you have massive system change. Lower life forms tend to be okay. If you're a jellyfish, you're happy. Um, so the question is, a re is, is quite a reasonable one, which is, can that happen again? I mean, we're doing in 200 years what the volcanoes were doing in 20,000 years, things went bad then, can that happen again? And when people tell you, well, plants love CO2, right, so this is actually a good thing, that's complete horse manure because, yeah, that's true, if that change happens over about 200,000 years in giving evolution a chance to get used to the higher CO2 level, if it happens quicker than that, you don't get lush jungle, you get death. You get species death. So um, then the question is, okay, is that going to happen again? What are the chances and where? I mean, if we're the Ocean Conservancy, we kind of have to know about this, right? Um, so I've been asked today to talk about our journey to big data in the cloud and, and our work with Amazon. And so I will tell you this as the story of what actually happened and how we got to this. We were deeply naive, right? We had no idea. Um, and so what we did is we asked, a bunch of oceanographers, and you have the physical oceanographers, the guys that know about currents and chemical composition and temperature and heat, and all of that. And we got the biologists, the biological oceanographers, into a big room on one side, and then we got some of the best big data systems people, network monitoring people, big data folks from the valley on the other side. And we spend a day together. And if we could roll the video, please. So this is basically what the oceanographers told the systems people about. They said, this is an incredibly complex system. You've got all of these air currents, which now go into the water currents. These are the water currents, beautiful, looks like a Van Gogh painting. You have the water currents coming out. This is the Gulf Stream coming out, out of the Gulf, coming along the side of Florida there. It's going by about seven million cubic meters per second. These are vast amounts of water, vast amounts of energy being transferred. You've got eddies going on all over the place. This is what makes our weather. Without this, civilization would happen in a very, very thin band on the world, and the rest would be too hot or too cold, right? This makes for a temperate climate. This is the big machine that makes it possible for you to live in Seattle. Actually, maybe Seattle would be okay. But you certainly couldn't live on the equator, and you couldn't live much north of here, right? 
And then these are basically the surface currents. Look at what a complex system this is. These are the surface currents driven by the winds. And now you dip under the water, the oceanographers explained, and you figure it out that this is not just surface current. There's all kinds of convection currents going on, deep currents, which pick up the heat from the equator and carry it all over to the Arctic. Stirring stuff up, bringing nutrients up. Some of them go as slowly as 100 years to, to complete their cycle. Some of them much quicker, right? Um, there are major ridges in the ocean, right? They're distributing nutrients to life. And here's the complexity of life. This is, for example, a kelp forest um, in, in California. You have a trophic web, in other words, things eating, animals eating animals, which is infinitely complex. Everybody is correlated to everything else. This is a conjoint system. This is a system that basically um, is not stovepiped. If you move something here through incredibly complex ways, something moves somewhere else. Right? Um, the energy transfer in this trophic web, is, by the way, is stunning. At the microbial level, the ocean makes about 100 million tons per hour, per hour of biomass, 100 million tons. But well, at the very top of it, let's call them fish, there's only about 800 million parts, uh, uh, tons in total. So you do have this incredible energy transfer going on of all that microbial biomass feeding up into relatively few fish. And in, an, in, 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 that, trans, in that transformation of energy, you bind about 60 gigatons of carbon. That brings us right back to climate change. 60 gigatons of, climb, of carbon is about equal to two years of the global industrial output of carbon, right? This stuff matters. Life in the ocean matters, even if you never eat fish. Life in the ocean is actually existentially important to you. So this is the kind of stuff that the oceanographers were talking about, and the systems guys were listening in that room, and they asked a lot of questions about data density. Um, and um, about data structure and so on. And then the oceanographers said, well, okay, the problem that we have is we want to know where the ocean is going to turn. We want to know about failure. What can you do for us? And the systems guy said, not a damn thing. First of all, the data, you think you have big data, it's a trifle. It's the flapping of butterfly wings. It's nothing, right? The internet, that's big data. It consists of data. You guys have a little bit on the physical oceanography. You have even less on the biology because you can't see the fish. You don't even know where they are. And you have nothing, well, not nothing, but you have really very little about the intersection between the two, the meeting point between the two. You got nothing. That's problem number one. Problem number two is the history of failure prediction in complex system is a failure. We spent billions trying to do failure prediction in complex systems and a lot of venture capital funds have gone broke trying to do that. So we really, can, if, if, if what you want is a spatially and temporally correct prediction of failure of the ocean, we can't do that for you. And we thought, oh shit. But we need to know, right? I mean, we've had such failures already. I just heard yesterday that the major failure of the, of the uh, um, Great Barrier Reef in Australia and that's a major failure. That's a third of the reef, not bleached, but gone. Would have been, no, was, the science of attribution is now getting very good. It's 135 times more probable that that happened because of climate change than not, right? So judge and jury, this is pretty good proof. I mean, that is not quite DNA level <laughs> proof of guilt, but that's pretty good attribution. So we were seeing that big things were happening we had this complex systems out there, and we had no idea really where is it going to fail, where is it going to turn, because me, as an advocate, I need to know about this, right? How am I going to save the ocean if I have no idea where it is in danger? So what we did is we went to the, we thought, hmm, well, who are the people out there who actually do this for a living, right? Who are dealing with a problem or with a, with a system that's unfathomably complex, and you can't really predict what's going on. But you can sort of look at the overall stability landscape, and you can sort of figure out, um, you know, what are, the, what are the bounds? How can I keep this system relatively stable? Even though I can't predict where it's going, how can I 
how can I look at the stability of it, the whole thing as it's sort of wafting and wobbling along and know when I'm in trouble and take some corrective measures? Well, those things are out there, those systems are out there, like international capital flows, like the internet itself. Um, so we started talking to those folks and we put together a research coalition and we had folks like uh, the global research uh, people at Goldman Sachs. We had people from the Valley that were doing network monitoring. We had the big climate uh, change models that built the big process models. Um, and we have come up now, and we're going to get into the more technical story of a way of actually looking at um, this problem. It's called OSIRIS. OSIRIS stands for something. Um, I don't ask me um, um, what it stands for. So again. Um, we're dealing with climate change. It's really sometimes you read the paper and it feels like the Climate Olympics. It's always everything that you hear is it's going faster, it's going, uh, the deviations are higher, they are stronger. Um, it's not a good um, picture. Here is the uncertainty that we're dealing with. Um, these are the IPCC forecasts of uh, emission from fossil fuels um, of uh, basically of CO2 over time. Right. This is like this looks like. Um, so at, at 2014, we're about we're close to 40 gigatons, 40 billion tons. When you look at this, it looks sort of like a hurricane cone, right? It, it, it could hit Miami or it could go far as far north as South Carolina, right? And there's this there's this big outcome in between. Except this for me as an oceanographer, this is a Category Five hurricane, right? And I live in New Orleans, which I do. This is, you know, I mean, in the outcome of this one, this is not some sort of nice to know. This is rather essential. You know, are we, are we dropping down to the, the blue scenario of a warming of 0 0.9 to 2.3? Well, probably the corals are going to suffer and there will be some bad effects. But we might be kind of okay, especially on the 0 0.9 end. Or are we going to go RCP and things go more than three degrees, in which case all bets are off in the ocean. There's one thing I can say right now that if there's going to be catastrophic effects of climate change, they will manifest in the ocean first. This much we already know. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with. Here's the complexity of the ocean, another way of, of, of looking at it. I'm not gonna go into there. Um, so what we did is we decided we're not going to build a model of the whole ocean and try to get specific on what might go wrong. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to describe the ocean in its major states. And there's a limited number of them. Every one of the green point is a, is a state. And the state may be the population of sharks. Another state may be the population of cyanobacteria or of benthic grazers or zooplankton, right? These are basically states in the sense that you could imagine it as a cup and a ball in it. And the ball is the sharks and the system is the cup. And the sharks wanna be at an equilibrium, but they can't because there's other balls and other cups that are pulling on that ball, right? So the whole system is, co is connected and, co and, and always dancing. Right? Everybody wants to be at equilibrium. Everything is tugging on everything. It's a complex system. So in fact, the system doesn't quite look like this. It looks like this. Actually, it doesn't look like this. I just made this up. If you put all the real lines in, if you really describe how all of these states are connected with each other, this chart would be deep black. Right? It's incredibly complex. Now, the, the blue dots, if, if the green dots are what is, population of sharks, population of bacteria, and so on, the blue dots are the forcers. They are the stressors. So you can see it is um, uh, fishing pressure, pollution, pH, i.e. ocean acidification, temperature, and so on and so forth. So now we can, what we can do is we can crank up the pressure on the system. We know what the states are. We know from science pretty well how the states are connected with each other. And sometimes, or oh, we know from science which states are connected to which others. And sometimes science tells us actually what the parameter of connection is. So for example, if I crank up, if I get 20% more sharks, I get 
less seals because sharks eat seals. Sometimes these relationships are known, sometimes they're not known, right? So now I know all this and I crank up the pressure. I look at the climate forecasts and I say, okay, what would happen to this thing if things were, um, if temperature went to two degree, if the pH levels went up by 40%, and if overfishing stays the same as today, right? Let's just take that as a scenario. Now, this is where things get a little depressing, and I'm gonna ask you to hang in there. You all with me so far? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, this gets a little data intensive. So, the thing about, global, about, about complex systems is that they're pretty resistant. They're resilient, right? Because they're so connected, they're kind of supple. You put a pressure on them, one thing goes bad, the other thing kind of compensates for it, and they sort of waft along for a while. So if we assume that all those stressors are not related to each other, that they're stovepiped, in other words, that the increase of pH doesn't drive, or that the increase of temperature does not drive an increase of acidity, that overfishing has nothing to do with any of these things. In other words, that these, that these forces that we are putting onto the ocean are actually separate from each other, then things are actually okay. Every one of these lines here is one of the states. So in the first left uppermost one, you have a blue line at the very top. Those are pinnipeds, seals. They're actually okay. I'm putting all these forces on it, they're okay. Sharks go down a little bit, toothed whales go down a little bit, some go down a little bit on the other. I don't know what the, the yellow line is or the orange line. Um, on the bottom right there, that goes down a little bit, but that's a nice story, right? The ocean is okay. But now let's see what happens as we crank up the synergy, i.e. the degree to which the things, the, the forcers, temperature, acidity, and so on, are actually correlated, are, are, are compounding each other. On the upper right, you see an index of the strength of that synergy, the degree to which they're actually connected. This one is a very low one, right? So we're starting from none, and now let's see what happens as we crank it up. Oops. Right? So, the, at a relatively, the time to failure to crash goes from never, very rapidly, to 40 years, 38 years, 30 years, 25 years, and so on. And I have done nothing but change my assumptions about how connected nature really is. And the thing about the ocean is, it's really connected. It's a liquid, right? It's the most interconnected medium on the planet. So these simulations um, are incredibly data intensive to run, and it's a completely new thing, right? It's incredibly data in intensive to run because what you have to do is Every one of those little green dots is basically a probability distribution, and this is for the geeks in the room, right? It's basically a, some sort of a normal distribution or a weeble or whatever. It's some sort of distribution of probabilities. So what you have to do is basically you have to run the largest Monte Carlo simulation on the planet because you're interrelating every one of these curves with every one of these other curves, right? And you're running 50 scenarios, and you're running each one of those for 50 years, maybe once a week. So run a Monte Carlo on this, times 50, times 50, times 50, right? That's, in, that's just, that, that's, a, that's a lot of data. That's absolutely supercomputing stuff. AWS was kind enough to, base, to give us their cloud. Um, this is run out of Oxford. And what it allows us to basically now do is to look at the stability landscape of the ocean. And you could look at it almost like a heat map. Right, um, where you know the redder it is, the more likely it is, given all the given the interconnectedness of everything, 
and given the degree to which the stressors that come on the ocean are actually synergistic, it tells you where we are most likely to get into trouble. And there's two responses to that, right? Response number one is to go to the climate negotiations and maybe to our president and say maybe getting out of Paris isn't such a great idea after all, right? Because look what happens here. <laughs> Things in the ocean don't have to be very much connected for us to have these kind of crashes. And if we have these kind of crashes, then a billion people are not eating any more ocean uh, uh, protein. That's not good. They, they, they don't just like it, they rely on it. You know, then we will have a burp of about 50% of the ocean cal carbon in flux right back into the atmosphere, and all of the risk models on climate are completely off, completely off, right? It's much worse than we think. So there's a very fundamentally important mitigation measure here that says the risk that climate change poses to the ocean has been mathematically not understood until now because nobody has been able to get the processing capacity and the math right to do these kind of calculations, to actually see what happens when you fully mathematically correctly uh, account for the compounding nature of the stressors in the ocean. That's one thing. The, the other thing we can do with that is to see um, where are the most endangered areas in the world. And these can be in the Arctic, where you have very short food, food chains, right? You have clams, you have walrus. No walrus, no, clam, no, no clams, no walrus. It's very easy, right? So that's pretty endangered. If we see a, nature to the clam, a, a danger to the clam, then we know the walrus are done. And maybe it is in coral reefs. Maybe it is in the fact that, we're, that the ocean, when, they get, when it gets hotter, gets more stratified no more nutrients come up and we get big crashes of zooplankton and the whales go away. Maybe, 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 we don't know, but we will have that sense of, or not just sense, we will have the data on where the trouble is looming and we can then say, maybe you should stop overfishing this. Maybe you should stop putting, um, you know, uh, massive amounts of nutrient into the Gulf of Mexico through the Mississippi for three months a year because you're tipping the system. Right. Maybe we can figure out the indicators and the tipping points in the ocean that we can do something about. I hope. Maybe we can do that. And I think um, that's basically it, and I'd be glad to open it up for questions. All right, does anyone have any questions or need any Kleenex? All right, thank you very much. Oh, no, oh just a second. We've got one question. Thanks so much for a great presentation. Uh, a question for you sort of in the guts of the thing and how you made this model. In, in creating the mathematical relationship between different variables, Right. Did you have to have a whole army of people going through research, identifying, <laughs> well, if this guy eats this, then these go down 10%, but not if this, and so on? Right. How did you chew through that, if it existed, to get to this? So you have, as everything, it's a trade-off, right? With this model, you have, you have two choices. You can either parameterize the, these relationships really well, right? In which case, the computer will give you relatively few failure scenarios and those will be quite meaningful. Or you don't parameterize them so well, in which case the computer gives you all kinds of catastrophic scenarios, and then you have to have a second model that basically tells them, well, which ones of these catastrophes are actually based on reasonable inputs? Like if the computer says all the sharks go away at a temperature of seven degrees, you say, well, that's not so bad. It's not gonna be seven degrees, at least not in the next 30 years. Secondly, um, so we have probably four postdocs who spent a year right now at Oxford parameterizing a model just for the, what we call the California Current, which is the, basically the entire West Coast uh, from here to, to Mexico, which is that big upwelling system. Um, so that's a lot of work, yeah, um, but postdocs are cheap. <laughs> um, and the, the third one is we're working now on there's all kinds of really excellent AI applications to um, work of, of actually automatically sifting through academic literature 
um, for key charts, keywords, and so on, which allows, you know, if you're doing massive parameterization, massive meta-analysis like this, that it doesn't take away the postdocs, but it makes, them, it makes it possible for them to be vastly more, like 10x more efficient. So we're working um, with MIT on some of the stuff that they're doing on, on sort of automizing a little bit the, the, uh, the, the meta-analytic process. All right, fascinating. Other questions? So Andreas, will you be available at lunch? Yes, I will be. Okay, so we are breaking now till one o'clock for lunch right out in the hallway. And we've had some uh, interesting discussions this morning, so I'm sure there will be a, a lot to talk about during the networking lunch. See you all at one o'clock.